Well, again, I'm so glad that you're here with us this morning. And if you have a copy of the scriptures, let me invite you to join me in the book of John. The gospel or the good news account of John, who was a follower of Jesus. And while you're turning there, let me share with you that in the past week we have seen snow. We've, we've seen 8 degree temperatures. We've seen 75 degree temperatures. We've seen the extremes of cold and heat. And this morning there is torrential downpours of rain. And, and the Bible talks about crazy weird signs that will happen before the Lord returns. I'm not sure if we're in the middle of those or if this is just living in Middle Tennessee. But you're here this morning and I'm glad you are. I read a story this past week of Christians who were under communist reign in parts of Asia and Eastern Europe who made statements like, I wish things like rain or snow were the only obstacles keeping me from gathering with brothers and sisters. And when you talk to our missionaries on the field who are in Spain or in Italy or France, when they come back, they, th this congregation, even on a day where not all of us are in this room, they say, this is the largest congregation I've been in in years. And it was just so good to hear people sing and to be united and lockstep together as the local church. So I'm so glad that you're here this morning as we begin a new sermon series in the Gospel of John. And we're going to spend several weeks in John. And so you can read ahead if you like, but we're going to read verses 1 through 5 together today. And one of the things that you need to know about John is that this gospel of John is this follower of Jesus. It's kind of like his thesis. It is his summary statement of who Jesus is. And one of the questions repeatedly raised throughout Jesus' life and ministry is, who is this man? That's the question John's asking. Like, who is this man? And if you know scripture, you know this. Who is this man that teaches with such authority were questions that people asked. Who is this man that, unlike other religious leaders, eats with outsiders and sinners? Who is this man that says he can forgive sin? Only God can do that. Who is this man? Who is this man, if he really is a king, that would ride humbly into Jerusalem, the seat of religious authority, on a donkey? Who is this man? And furthermore, who is this man, if he really is a king? who would allow himself to be crucified on behalf of those who follow him. Who is this man? My prayer is that as we make our way through the book of John and through this text today, that you would ask, maybe for the first time, who is this man? And what are the implications for your life? Would you stand with me in honor of God's word as we read the gospel of John, verses 1 through 5 in the first chapter? It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and all things were created through him. And apart from him, not one thing that was created, not one thing was created that has been created. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. And that light shines in the darkness and yet the darkness did not overcome it. The word of God is living and active and it is our truth. More than what we think, more than what we see, more than even what we feel, truth and reality is rooted for the followers of Jesus in his word. So let me read that again. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and all things were created through him, and apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. And in him was life, and that life was the light of men, and that light shines in the darkness, and the darkness will not overcome it. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, it is so easy as finite, uh, weak, fleshly created beings to, to, to want to base reality in what we think is true and real, in what we see, and even in what we feel and what our experiences are. And Lord, those certainly play a part. What we see, what we think, and what we feel all contributes to how we make our way forward in this world. They do, but, but truth is found in your word. And Lord, as we begin this sermon series, we make that declaration that studying your word, feasting on your word, prioritizing your word, standing in honor of your word 
is a tantamount importance to this congregation. Lord, please feed us by the power of your word. Build us up by the power of your word and send us out into the community by the power of your word that we might take part in bringing your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven for your glory and your name and your renown. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, John, this follower of Jesus, begins his eyewitness account of the ministry and the life of Jesus by sharing with us that in the beginning, and what he means there is literally in the beginning, at the start of all things, the, the creation of the universe as we know it, the beginning of humanity, in the beginning was the word. And the, the Greek word here for word is logos, or speaking, or a message, or even written words. But it's not just God's message to us, it's, it's the personalized message of God. It's a person. And so when John says, in the beginning was the word, he's talking about Jesus, not only his written word, but his revelation of who he is to us in the person of Jesus Christ. In other words, when all of creation and human history started, Jesus, God's revelation to us, everything that can be known about God is revealed in the person of Jesus. That's why we make much of Jesus. That's why we read about Jesus. That's why we pray to Jesus, because truth can be known and Everything about God can be known through the person of Jesus Christ that he's revealed to us. Jesus has always existed. The big doctrinal word would be he is preeminent. He's always existed. He was never created. And some of us would say, yes, we, we know that. But in 2016, Lifeway Research did a comprehensive study with Legionnaire Ministries throughout the United States. And over 3,000 people were polled through strategic settings in large cities throughout our country. And 78% of the people said that they affirmed this statement that Jesus is the first and greatest created being. The 78% of Americans that were surveyed said Jesus is the first. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's of primary importance, and he's the greatest of created beings. But it is so important for us doctrinally and to understand that nobody created Jesus. He has always existed. He was preeminent. And the Bible tells us here that in the beginning was Jesus. He didn't just show up. We just came out of Advent or the Christmas season. He doesn't just arrive in the New Testament. He doesn't just arrive in the manger in Bethlehem. Now, one of the things John is doing is John is also talking to Jews who followed God and wanted to obey God and stay in a right relationship with God. And before Jesus' arrival, the way you stayed in a right relationship with God is you obeyed all of his commands and all of his rules. You may remember that our original parents, Adam and Eve, sinned against God in the Garden of Eden. And when they sinned and they broke his commands, God didn't quit loving them. And if there's somebody in this room or somebody online, you, you feel you've made a royal mess of your life. You, you, you couldn't have messed up more than that, ushering sin in, into the world. But God never quit loving. He never quit pursuing. And he won't do that with you who are created in his image. And so one of the ways that God said, there's got to be a way you can stay in relationship with me is to obey my commands and my rules and my laws. Now, one of the things that was obvious to the people was that like, trying to do that was burdensome. It was overwhelming. Like, one of the things I struggle with is following one or two rules daily or weekly. Like, I, I don't do well with those things. Like, could you imagine six, 700 almost laws and rules of staying in a right relationship with God? One of the reasons we read the Old Testament, one of many, and it's on down the list of what we see when we read it, is just nobody can live up to all those commands. So it primes your heart. It, it prepares your heart to groan and want someone who can fulfill all the things that none of us are good enough to measure up to. And, and that's what leads us, hopefully, in our hearts and our yearnings towards Jesus, who's fully God. And when he came as the Christ child, the incarnation, fully human, Jesus did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill all of the law perfectly in a way that we cannot. That's what makes Jesus like us, that when you pray, if you prayed 10 minutes ago corporately as we prayed, if you pray in your cubicle at work or in your dorm room at your campus or university, like Jesus knows how it feels to be human. I love that about God. He knows he's different than every other purported lowercase g God out there in the world. He knows what it's like to be human, but he can do something about our brokenness. He can intercede for us when we pray to him in ways we cannot because he's perfect and he perfectly fulfilled the law. So John's talking to a Jewish audience that would say, you really want to worship God? And they would say, yes. 
Let me ask you, like, do you want to do what God wants you to do? And most of us who are followers of God would say, yes. Do you want to know you're in God's will? Yes. Do you want to know that you're bringing him joy? Yes. And so John said, then, because Jesus is the full expression of God's word in the law, then you need to accept Jesus. <laughs> Many of the Jews were like, whoa, whoa, whoa. The, the humble carpenter... Um, who wasn't like kingly or even necessarily good looking. Isaiah said that, if you think like that's mean of me to say about Jesus, Isaiah says there's nothing about Jesus that would make us say, that's him when he walked in a room. You mean the carpenter? Born in a barn or a cave? Like, you mean that, that served? And Mark 10, 45 said, I have not come to be served, but to serve? Like that guy? The one who laid down his life on the cross? He said, for the sins of humanity, like, you want us to accept him? And many of the Jews struggled. I just, I can't do it. And there are many people who are not Jewish. There are many people who are interested in spiritual things that would say Jesus is a good teacher. They may even say he's the first and most important of created beings, but he's not God. There will be people who struggle with that. Maybe you feel that way this morning. I think church and being in community with others is the perfect place to, to really dust for God's fingerprints and to find out like the claims of Christ and who he says he is. And is this really the son of God? Is it really what John said and what this pastor is saying to you this morning? Is it really true? One of the things we see here is it says, In the beginning the word was with God and the word was God. So hang on to that point right there for just a minute that really, if you got doubts or you're skeptical, a great place would be safe, welcoming, hospitable community. And if we're in the church, part of the bride of Christ, we would call that biblical community. That would and should be one of the best environments with fertile soil, like we were talking about earlier, where you can really plant some seeds and really dig deep down into the Word of God to, to further explore the claims of Christ. In the beginning, the word was with God. John reminds us, doesn't that language sound familiar? In the beginning, where have you heard that before? Right? In the beginning, Genesis. John, when you read, I want you during January to read John's gospel. I want you during January to read John's gospel. That's our homework as a congregation. Now, we can do that, right? We get in, you're like, oh my gosh, like it is the 10th. I'm way behind. Like you can do this. You can really do this in the next 20, 21 days, okay? Read the Gospel of John, and you'll see where John ties together. He echoes a lot of the words of Genesis. In the beginning, Jesus existed in relationship with the Father. Jesus the Father. This is where doctrinally the word Trinity doesn't show up in the Bible, but the word Trinity describes God dwelling in three distinct persons. Not three gods, one God dwelling in three persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Although they are God... And they are one. They have distinct roles. The Father is not the Son. The Father is the Father. The Son is the Son. And the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. For instance, Jesus does not walk the planet anymore. I don't know if that shocks anybody. You're waiting on him to jump around the corner from you at work tomorrow. I don't know. But, like, he does not walk the planet. After about 40 days after his resurrection, which really happened, which, as crazy as that might sound, like, it really happened. He ascended into heaven and then sent us his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the presence of the risen Jesus. So when all of those promises in the Old Testament, I will love you and never leave you or forsake you, even if you're unfaithful to me, I will never leave you or forsake you. God sent his Spirit. And do you know what's even cooler for us than for the original disciples? Do you know that while Jesus was with them, he was not inside of them? He was with them. And he told them, if I leave, it's going to be better. And they were like, what? Are you serious? Like, you're here. But when he left, then he could pour out his spirit. And the Bible says that when we place our faith in the finished work of Jesus and we believe his claims and repent of our sin and invite him into our life, God's Holy Spirit takes up residence in our hearts and in our lives. We are marked. We're sealed in the spiritual world. You stick out like a sore thumb if you're a follower of Jesus in the spiritual world. You do. Whether you know it or not, you're sealed for the day you go to be with Jesus forever in a literal place called heaven, or whether Jesus comes back to receive us. It's a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. In our house, we use green light. The kids use green light. I don't know if you use green light with teenagers or kids, but green light is like a debit system where we can reward the kids for, for chores, and we can, we can give them 50 cents for this chore. We can deposit 25 cents for this one. That sounds like we're running a feudal enterprise, but it's not, I promise. Like, <laughs> 
but we can like deposit and the kids are so fired up when there's a deposit guaranteeing money's in the green light account. I, I had the kids tithe envelopes this morning and it was so cool because on green light you can donate to a charity or a church and they were like, is I have South on this? Dad, is I have South on green light? And I look, I'm like, I have South not on green light. We got to fix that. Next generation's asking about giving to the church. We got to fix that. We got to fix that. The kids love a deposit guaranteeing what can be withdrawn. When you ask Jesus into your life, the Holy Spirit is given to you as a deposit so that when you slip into eternity like a member of ours did in this congregation on Wednesday night, and you open your eyes, and the first breath you draw in eternity, you see Jesus, and your faith is made sight. You don't have to have faith anymore because you can see him. You can touch him. Don't you envy brothers and sisters, saints that have gone before us of that, right? And Jesus looks and says, you belong to me. You, I recognize you, you belong to me. And this is your inheritance, a literal place where, first of all, you don't come to Jesus to get stuff from Jesus. You come to Jesus for Jesus. All eternity will be with, being with Jesus in a literal place where there's no suffering, there's no pain, there's no hardship, there's no cancer, there's no coronavirus, there's no Delta, Omicron, run through the Greek alphabet, whatever it may be. Like, there's, there's nothing like that there. It's a literal place. You're sealed. The Holy Spirit, God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit exist in relationship with one another. And, and I one time heard a pastor say, you know, very much like we talk about getting involved in small groups, being in community. How awesome is it that God reveals himself in relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? That the three of them exist in relationship to one another. And if you read the Bible, God is saying, look at my son, look at my son, look to my son for salvation, look at my son. And the son's always saying, look to the father, look to my father. I only do what my father wants. And the spirit is saying, I've come to point you towards what Jesus said is true. Look to Jesus, look to Jesus. They exist in relationship with one another, honoring and glorifying one another. How important is it for us if our God reveals himself in what is perhaps the first small group biblical community ever? How important is it for you to be in biblical community? Now, one of the things that I wish people that were joining us online right now could be in the room for is to see those big, bright orange balloons in the commons area this morning, right? For those of you, go big orange Tennessee fence. I'm so sorry that's not for your vols, okay? It's not. For those of you that just threw up in your mouth, okay, let's just move past that, okay? That is because it's Group Connect Sunday, it is Group Connect Sunday, and I wrote in my journal, we're talking about, God, where would you plant us in a permanent facility? And as wonderful as this building has been, we do not own it. So the lease payments we make, and God has provided a wonderful landlord and a wonderful facility. Think about what all that money could do going towards ministry and missions, right? That gets me excited. I pray about such things. And in 2009, when I was thinking about, Lord, where would we be here? Where would we be in 2022, 2023? One of the things I wrote in my journal is it would grieve me if we had God-honoring worship services on Sunday, which I believe we have had. Dave, Caleb, Victoria, Rachel, like everybody who's been up here pointing us towards Christ. Hopefully you've been met or encouraged if you're a visitor. If you're a longtime member and you see somebody you don't know, say hi to them. Say hello to them. Hopefully you've, you've seen someone in the name of Jesus be hospitable, that we would have God-honoring services. But there's 167 hours in a week. And my prayer is that we would be the people of God, the family of God. And what we do on Sunday would be like the launch pad for the remaining six days of our week, right? You cannot flesh out. Like if this is true, in the beginning was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things were created through him. You mean Jesus was creating stuff? I thought he just showed up in Bethlehem. i got to talk to somebody about this. You're most likely not going to raise your hand in the middle of a sermon, which is discipleship, but it's one way, and say, Pastor, I have a question. I really need to flesh this out. Biblical community with groups of peers is where you're most likely going to be able to do that best. And right out there in the commons area, there are women and men who love Jesus and want to encourage biblical community in our church that we want you when you leave here. If you're not in a small group, if you're not in a group of, of, of friends, 10 to 15 to 20, some, some of our groups are 25, they're in a small group, but that's a conversation for another day. It's happening and it's working. We have larger groups. If you're like, I, I don't like that, I just a smaller, more intimate we have Bible reading groups, groups of men and women who meet three or four people that get together and read the word. And if this is true, then what does this mean for our lives? And they pray together, a band of brothers, if you will. 
a, a group of sisters that get together and, and, and lock arms into the mission of God together. Or you may want a mentor. If you're, if you're here and you're like, I don't, I, don't, I don't have time to get connected to a group and that ain't my thing. And I just, we can connect you one-on-one -on -one with a mentor in this church who's walked with Jesus just a little bit longer than you have perhaps. That can pour into you. We have a large percentage of our congregation meeting with a mentor in our mentor relationships ministry. But if you're not in biblical community, do not leave this building. Not because Aaron said so, but because the word says that in the beginning, it is so healthy for you to be in relationship with God and in community with others, which is the local church. If you have not already blown your resolutions out of the water 10 days in, or if you have, go ahead and make this one of them. This year, I will. I know it's scary. I know it's scary for some of us to be known. We're afraid I might be known and not loved. I can't wait for heaven to be fully known, to take off any mask we're wearing, and to be fully loved by God. I, I got news for you. You have that right now. Lord Jesus, help our, help our congregation. Help us believe that now. You are fully known and fully loved. That, that is why if you're in groups, they can't be cliques. You cannot be cliquish. You can't make it hard for people to get connected. You can't gossip and talk about people when they divulge something that is very sensitive or personal or hard. We can't do that to one another. That's going to happen in the world, not in the church. Can you imagine if these safe, fertile, like the water and the soil environments exist in the church, where at the end of this service, people come forward and say, this church is going somewhere, like it's growing spiritually, numerically. We're praying about a long-term building to to retain who's here and to engage hundreds, if not thousands more. This is exciting. Like, I want to be a part of this. And they step forward in faith, and we're not ready to receive that step. But I praise God for the staff and the leaders of this church. We're ready. Don't you leave here this morning without pursuing community. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 3, all things were created through him. There is nothing that is created that wasn't created by Jesus and exist for Jesus. And I know that's not probably a, an encouraging message for our flesh that just wants what we want, but you and I were created for Jesus, for his glory and for his joy. And when I was younger and I would hear pastors preach that, I'm like, that sounds so like not enjoyable. Like what's in it for me? What's in it for me? Like I want to, I got dreams, I got hopes, I got goals, like I, and you may too as well. But when you realize that Jesus is sufficient in and of himself, Jesus did not create any of us because he lacks anything. But he created us for his pleasure and his joy and for relationship with us. Humanity is the pinnacle of creation. We were created by Jesus and for Jesus. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about living that mist or a vapor of a life which is so swift and fleeting. And our brother James says, you don't even know if you'll get to wake up tomorrow. So make the most of the day. And spend your life not giving it away, but investing it in what matters eternally. Because everything exists for Jesus. How awesome would it be if the reputation of Avenue South in the city of Nashville is, and that church loves to make much of Jesus. And I believe that happens. I do. So that's not a passive-aggressive way of saying, get it together, church. we got work to do. Like, I believe that's happening. But what if the Lord increased our influence with the gospel in the future? What if he continued to say, this is a church I can trust. This is a church that's serious about being in my word and growing with one another and locking arms with one another to step into the mission of God. Like, I want to empower and increase their influence with the gospel in the city of Nashville. And even if people didn't want our Jesus, they said it is undeniable that these people believe they are created for the glory of Jesus and they want his name to be made famous in the city of Nashville. How wonderful would that be as our reputation? I hope the music's good. I hope the preaching is nourishing. I hope the balloons are bright enough. I hope things are great and, and we spend time on the little stuff. I do, but what if that was our reputation? God created us for his glory and his joy and in him was life Eternal life is found in the person of Jesus Christ. It is found in the person of Jesus Christ. God sent Jesus 
to give us eternal life. That was the purpose of that. The, the word for eternal in the Greek is the word zoe. Anybody eat at Zoe's Cafe? The next time you see the word zoe, it means like a quality of life that you cannot find on your own. It means like a quality, an abundance, a flourishing, a, a, a nourishing type of life that is life-giving. And our brother John later said, Jesus came to give us life, eternal life, and a type of life that is abundant, that is life-giving. That's available to you right now. God sent Jesus to give us eternal life. All the things I've told you about heaven, all the things I've told you about relationship with God, and all of the ways it glorifies him, but it brings us great joy and excitement that we're part of something that matters individually and together. It's found in the person of Jesus. That's why we make much of him. That's why we read about him. That's why we stand in honor of his word. The word of God made known to us, Jesus. One of my favorite Bible stories is in Nehemiah chapter 8. One of my favorite Bible stories is in Nehemiah chapter 8. The people of God, the, the Israelites, who, who later became known as the, he, the Hebrews, they, 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 they had been exiled to Babylon. They had been hauled off into captivity for many decades, and they were, they were mistreated, and they were in captivity. And when they finally got to go home, a guy named Nehemiah earned favor with a new king, and he said, let me go back to Jerusalem. Let me rebuild my city walls. It's in shambles. And the, and the king let him go, and Nehemiah, in about 50 days or so, did so. It's, it's a phenomenal story, the book of Nehemiah. I've been to Jerusalem, and I've seen part of Nehemiah's wall rebuilt the city walls. He rebuilt the city of Jerusalem. And when they did that, do you know what the people craved the most? Do you know what, when the city was rebuilt, what the people wanted? They had the brick. They had the mortar. They had their homes somewhat restored. But the Bible says they were hungry for the word of God. They were hungry to hear from the word of God. What if we were so hungry to hear from Jesus and so committed to his word that he spoke to us and empowered us to do what he wants us to do in his world? The Bible said they asked the scribe named Ezra. Some of you have named your children Ezra. They asked the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses. That's the scripture. That's the word of God that they had. And to bring it into the square and while Ezra was facing the square in front of the water gate, he read out of the Bible, he read out of the Holy Scriptures from sunup until noon. And ain't nobody leave. They all stood there for approximately six hours. The men, the women, and those who could understand all the people listened attentively, and the scribe Ezra stood on a high wooden platform that was made for the sole purpose of unleashing the Word of God to feed and nourish and empower his people. That's why we stand on a platform. That's why we have what we call, this is a table, but pastors have pulpits to, 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 to proclaim the Word of God, to just open it up. And as one follower of Jesus in previous centuries said, it's just like you open it up the lion of God and you unleash him to do what he needs to do in our life and in our world. And Ezra opened the book in full view of all the people. And get this, you ever wonder why we stand in honor of God's word? Have you ever wondered that? For me, this is one of the verses of why we do it. And as he opened the holy word of God, all the people stood up. They stood up. To say God is in this place and he is speaking. Some pastors say, speak Lord, your servant is listening. That's what we're doing here. We don't need to neglect this. That's why our Bible reading groups, our mental relationships, our life groups, are they're, in, they're, they're undergirded and supported by the word first and foremost more than any other Christian author because those are just men and women like us. But the word of God, which is authoritative, without error, it's trustworthy, it's living, it's active, it matters now. It's relevant. You don't have to prop God's word up to make it relevant. It can make a difference in your life. You need wisdom, it's found here. You need guidance, it's found here. You need comfort, sometimes this is the best pillow to lay your head and your life upon at night. You need it, it's found here. And the people stood up and they worshiped for hours on end. One of the things we will not do and one of the things we will most definitely double back on 
and put further roots into spiritual soil is prioritizing the Word of God in our gatherings, in our small groups of community, in our service, in our missions. And that is why we want everyone to feast on God's Word. I brought my Bible that I read daily throughout the year. It's a chronological Bible. It literally lays out, today you read this, tomorrow you read that. You'd probably like more out of your pastor, but sometimes I need it to tell me, do this and stop here, then start here. I brought this to show you. This is single column. I preach out of double column, but I like the single column when I'm reading each day. I don't care what you read, how you read it, but you can still make up time 10 days in to reading and feasting on the Word of God in addition to what we study on Sunday mornings. This is the Word of God revealed to us. Not only don't let us neglect it, but let us be built up by it and let us be sent out in the power of Jesus by it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And all things were created through Him. And apart from Him, or apart from His Word, you cannot survive. And in Him was life, and that life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, yet the darkness does not comprehend it. In here is where you find the promises of God, and all of them come true in the person of Jesus. In a beautiful but a broken world where darkness and evil and hardship of just being in a broken world where bodies break down and things don't work like they should. As dark as it gets on the darkest day, it will not choke out the power of the light of Jesus Christ. John wrote from a perspective after Jesus' resurrection. John knows how the story ends. He knows how the story ends. The darkness cannot comprehend it. And as one writer said, the prospect of victory is the reason there is a church and a gospel and why small groups of Christians like those who first read John's gospel, who were being squeezed by the world, could make a powerful confession concerning Christ. The decisive moment in history had already come and Christ had won. That's what you and I need to root our lives in. It's the word of God living and active and no matter what comes, God will be faithful and his word will sustain his church and his people because the darkness will not overcome the light. And if for no other reason as a follower of Jesus to read the word, be in the word, build our church on the word, is to be reminded that in Christ You are more than a conqueror. And that's a message that our world needs to hear. Let me invite you to bow your head and close your eyes for just a moment.